Hello. Hi. All right. How many of you guys are on fall break? Did anybody sleep in today? Who, who thinks they slept in the latest? Mariska, what time did you wake up? Anybody wake up later than two? What? I'm both really excited that my kids are here and also really terrified because I have no idea what they're going to say at any given point in time. Um, all right, really quick. Hi, I'm Jamie. I'm married to that one. Um, I gave life to those four. I also have a dog and a cat and a guinea pig, and I'm 31 years old and I live with my parents. Does anybody else live with your parents? It's a fun time. It's a fun time, especially when they buy your groceries. Just kidding, I still buy my own groceries. All right, now you know about me. I have had a little bit of a doozy of a day. Anybody wish they could have slept in today and actually your day ended up being nothing like what you pictured? Yeah? So I have been praying about tonight for, how long ago did you put me on the schedule? Like months? I didn't procrastinate, I promise. I made this important. But for some reason, I wrestled and wrestled and wrestled and finally made it to today and I sat down to study this and I just, I can't, I can't come up with my own things that I want to share with you. I just kept landing on scripture, which kind of sounds like a cop out, but also scripture is perfect. I think Abby spoke last week and shared about the importance of reading your Bible. I know on the weekends, Pastor Jonathan is talking about how to read your Bible. And so mostly tonight, what I'm going to do is just read you the Bible. <laughs> is it okay if I just stand up here and read the Bible to you for 30 minutes? Are we all good with that? I might, I might get a little, a little embellishment, but we're going to kind of see where this goes. I'm going to pray really quick. Heavenly Father, thank you for tonight, God. Thank you that these students are going to hear your voice, not mine. They're going to receive your message, not mine. They're going to hear your words and nothing else, God. Thank you that their hearts have been prepared, even if it was unbeknownst to them, for what you have for them to receive tonight, and it is going to change their life from here on out, if they will let it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Does anybody know what's wrong with teenagers these days? Social media, school. How many of you guys are like, my teacher's the problem for sure? Got that one teacher? Yeah? Anybody? No? You're all better students than me. Any issue in my life I could like always bring back to my chemistry teacher? Like even like marital issues. Just kidding. We have a perfect marriage. But if we did have marital issues, I'm sure my chemistry teacher is to blame somehow. That woman had it out for me. And probably still does wherever she is, Mrs. Kason. Just kidding, she actually was awesome, but uh, and when I was a teenager, I thought that she was a monster. It's crazy how your perspective changes someday. I won't spoil it for you. So, what's wrong with you these days? You said social media. Did anybody say screen time? Did anybody grow up watching like way too much SpongeBob and it has like kind of wrecked your sense of humor? Maybe you think your humor's great, but I know otherwise because you watch too much SpongeBob. My kids are like, what's Spongebob? We're not allowed to watch that. They're not. <laughs> also, they're not allowed to eat Oreos. I'm positive Cade probably had a gross one, but he just had no idea and was so excited to be eating an Oreo. At one point, I saw him, like, fight swallowing hard, and I'm sure it was ketchup. I, <laughs> I feel like I know what the problem with all of you is. Would you like me to tell you what is wrong with all of you? It's not necessarily things like social media or school or the world's voice. I think that you all, because of those voices, often to put too much pressure on yourself. I am the last person in the world who's going to walk up here and say, you're the victim. You should own it. I will come up here and tell you the enemy is trying to make you the victim. Don't let him. So tonight I want to read you some scripture that should hopefully allow you to let go of the pressure to show up in any condition. My kids are here. How many of you guys remember me from like before we left and came back? How many of you guys were like, did it even happen? <laughs> it did. I was really cool back then, right? Like I was cool. I was like the cool grown up. My thumb, 
Kate just gave me a thumbs down, which was rude. That's fine. That's fine. A, th- a medium thumb? What is that? Thumbs up. Thanks. Uh, I used to be cool. Now I'm, I'm not as cool, and I'm really owning it. So I'm going to start uh, today with a children's story. You ready? And I'm going to make it up as I go, so don't fault me for plot lines or holes in the plot. So once upon a time, there was a world, a universe. Let's say it's a garden, and in this garden, people live, and I don't know if you've ever done any gardening, but there's a lot of dirt involved. Like There's plants, there's weeds, there's things that you're supposed to prune and cut, and, and everybody that lives in this garden works the garden, and everybody that lives in this garden is always covered in dirt. Now, I'm not just talking about like a little bit of dust, but if you've ever gotten your hands into like compost or soil, you can brush it off, but after time, you get this like cakey, thin stuff, and you're like, oh, I for sure need a sink right now. I cannot function until it, or I've got some like awesome natural nails. If you saw these puppies after some gardening, you'd be like, bleh, because I have half the garden like underneath them, and you're just like, somebody get me some soap. The people that live in this garden always have dirt on them. But there was this one group of people, bear with me, they always smelled like strawberries. No matter where in the garden they worked, no matter how covered in dirt they were, they were always together and they always smelled like strawberries. Now, there was a little girl who lived in the garden. Let's name her, let's name her Taylor. Is there a Taylor in here? No? Cool. There was. I don't want to know what happened to Taylor. I don't want to be sad. So we're going to call her Taylor. Maybe we should call them Taylor. That way it could be a boy or a girl in case boys don't want to relate to, like, a little girl in a story. But then I'm going to get mixed up with pronouns, and we're just going to call it a little girl. Cool? Cool. Look, I'm relevant. That was a relevant joke. Ha, ha, ha. So this little girl, Taylor, she works all day long in this garden. And she loves her life. This is the life that they all know. And she digs in the dirt. She pulls the weeds, she waters the flower beds, she does all the things that she's supposed to do, but she always notices people from the group that smells like strawberries. And she's never told anybody the desire before. The people that she works with, she's never said, I want to smell like strawberries. But she knows and she thinks it. And deep, deep down, she has a desire to be one of the people in that group, working the garden, smelling like strawberries, no matter what. And so she begins to come up with this plan. No matter what part of the garden that she's in, no matter what she's doing, no matter what her task list is for the day, she is like, how can I begin to get over there in that group? I must need to smell like strawberries. And so she would go and she would always walk through the strawberry fields in order to get to her job that day. She would touch the strawberries. She only ate strawberries at one point. Eventually, she starts like taking showers and washing, and no matter what, it's strawberry-scented soap or strawberry this or strawberry that. She even tries wearing all pink for a season. No matter what she did, she couldn't get the smell to last, and all she wanted was to be in this group, and she just knew if she could smell like a strawberry like the rest of them, she would be accepted into this group. Now, there are two versions There are two endings to this children's story. I'll tell you the short one first. This girl grew up always trying, always working, trying and never succeeding to smell like a strawberry. So she never made it into that group. And she was born, she lived, and she died just a garden worker. Second version. One day, Taylor decides, I'm just going to be brave enough to go talk to them. And so she does everything she can to smell like a strawberry. She puts it all over her. She wears the pink. She walks through the strawberry fields. And there is a member of this ever-evasive strawberry group. And she talks to her. Let's say her name is Bev. It's a friendly name, right? You talk to somebody named Bev. Taylor walks up to Bev, and she goes, Hi, I'm Taylor. And Bev doesn't really look up from her work, but says, Hi, I'm, I'm Bev. Taylor, she's, the conversation's not going to go any farther. So she finds herself asking questions. Like, well, what are you working on? Well, I'm trimming the bean stalks. I'm pruning so that they can produce new fruit for the season. She, oh, okay, I've never, I've never done that job before. Where did you get that job? I don't know. The master gardener gave me this job, and so I'm, I'm doing this every day. 
Taylor sees that this conversation is going nowhere. She's like, if I can just ask a question that will trick her into telling me how she smells like strawberries, I can go and smell like strawberries and be a part of this group. Through the conversation, finally, Taylor, in this most exasperated, she's about to give up. She has nothing to lose. She's already embarrassed herself. She's tried her entire life to smell like a strawberry to impress this group of gardeners. She says, I just don't get it. I'm doing all the same things you're doing on my plant that you're doing, and I can't smell like a strawberry. You guys will never accept me. And Bev stops. She looks up for the first time, and she sets her tools down, and she says, come with me. So Bev takes Taylor's hand, and they walk to the master gardener who has been giving out all of these tasks. And she says, this is the master gardener. He's the one who gives us work. When we spend time with him, and when we work together in the strawberry fields, then we all smell like strawberries. And Taylor has this moment where she realizes, in the second ending, not the first one, because remember that first ending, she never asked the questions and she was never able to smell like a strawberry herself. She finds out this group does not stick together because they all smell like strawberries. This group smells like strawberries because they're together. Anybody like, why is she talking about smelling like strawberries? (laughs) Children's book? I don't know, anybody still read children's books? I want to read you some scripture tonight. Because I have this fear and I have this concern that some of you guys feel like before you show up here, you're supposed to already smell like strawberries. But I want to encourage you tonight that that's not the case. The reason we smell like strawberries is because we're here together. How many of you guys have ever heard the word righteousness? I grew up in church. I grew up at church in the 90s. I went to a Christian school. I was a pastor's daughter, and then I was a pastor's wife, and now I'm a pastor. Righteousness is a really easy word for me to say, but when I start thinking about the definition of it, it's a little scary. Does anybody know the definition of righteousness off the top of their head? Kingston. Set apart. Rachel. Right, standing with God. That's a really good one. Righteousness is the fruit that we bear in our life when we are connected to God. But sometimes when we walk into the church world, which I have never walked into the church world, I was born in it, and I've grown up in it. And honestly, I'm not going to apologize for the fact that I've never really walked away from it. Me and God have mostly been tight my whole life. So it should be easy for somebody like me to be like, I live a life of righteousness. Yeah? No. Righteousness is still a challenge for me. I can come up here. I'm 31 years old, almost 32. I'm still a little bit cool, but mostly I'm a mom of four. I spend my day trying not to yell at my kids. Does that sound like righteousness? Kids, do I ever yell at you? (laughs) Sometimes I do. Do I sometimes apologize for yelling at you? Oh, (laughs) I do sometimes. Sometimes they have it coming. Sometimes they, no. I do not live a righteous life on my own. My righteousness comes from my father. But let me ask you something. And this is not like a trick question. I want you to just like easily come into this thought. If you see me or you see Pastor Charlie or Pastor Isaiah or Tina or another leader here, is it easy for you to just assume that they live a life of righteousness because they're working at a church? Sometimes just that quick assumption, you didn't even think about it. It was just like something that you expected to be will cause you to feel like you're not enough. Some of you guys are are held captive by this feeling or this anxiety before church or the night before or when you talk to a church friend that, you know, you're going through the motions, but you're just faking it or You say that you're this, but you know, even though you're doing your best, that that's not true. Well, I want you to know that your righteousness does not expose you to the love of Christ. Being exposed to the love of Christ will produce righteousness in you. How many of you guys have ever taken a shower? You were covered in dirt, and you took a shower, and what happened? 
You were clean. Unless you're Cade. Sometimes we got to help you out, right? It's fine. We don't take, and you, we don't take a bath so that we can take a shower. Now, I will say there are times that you are outside playing in the mud and your mom is like, I would like to hose you off before you enter my house. Like, I get that. So don't bring that into this analogy. God is not asking you to clean up your act so that you can show up here and clean up your act. I have another revelation that I want to lay on you. I don't even think that God is asking you to clean up your act. I think that God is asking you to show up so that he can love you. And do you want to know what the result is of receiving really great love? Your act gets cleaned up. Jeremiah talks about God's people drinking from glasses that are broken. It was this analogy of people looking to false gods to fill their life for fulfillment, but it couldn't hold water. How many of you guys have ever gotten coffee from here or tea or from anywhere and the lid didn't fasten the right way? And so every time you took a drink, it would come out a little bit or dribble down and you'd just be like, first of all, I hate that something I love as much as coffee could betray me like that. <laughs> Second of all, what you need is a cup and a lid that works, that holds the contents it's supposed to have so that you can be satisfied by the product. Yeah? A lot of times we are looking to things like our own personal comfort or the encouragement from friends or the feedback on social media or whatever it is to satisfy us. And that doesn't produce good fruit. That doesn't make you feel righteous. And the less righteous you feel, the less worthy of love you feel. It's a mind game that the enemy begins to play with us. So I... I'm a visual person, and I like taking notes, and I'm a little bit cocky because I feel like everything I'm saying is really good, so I got paper and pens for you to take notes of the things that I'm saying because it's the word of God. Yana's going to give it to you. Yeah? Yeah. Um, newsflash, it's just the Bible. I did not add anything to this paper, so I want you to know if you have a pen and you still add nothing to this paper, when you take it home, it will change your life because it has God's word on it. You could go to sleep right now, not hear another thing I say, and take that paper home, and it's life-changing. Everybody's focused on passing out paper and pencil. Wait a second. It's fine. <laughs> All right, somebody who has the paper, tell me what it is. The Bible. Where in the Bible is it? John 15, this is what we call a gospel. John is one of the books that tells the story of Jesus' life, and it tells the story of how you receive Jesus to change your life. Pretty cool. Does anybody know what the word gospel means to us? Good news. I have good news for you guys tonight, and it's in the book of John, and it's chapter 15. Uh, again, with the cockiness, um, I put it all on one side so that you would have room to write down lots of great things that God wants to say to you. Because I'm positive he wants to say those things. And I'm here to tell you, you are free to listen. You don't have to be or feel or say or do the right thing. You don't have to clean up for that shower. God wants to show you his love tonight. That's the end. Okay? Okay. Let's start reading together. Uh, like any good scripture verse, I like to start right in the middle. So if you look down at verse number 10, it is in the middle because there's also a back. It says, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. Oh, look, this is conditional. If you this, then you this. If you keep his commandments, then you get to remain in his love, right? Does that mean if we don't keep his commandments, no more love? But that's kind of what it sounds like, right? But wait, there's more. I'm going to read you a verse in Matthew 5, 8. Something that Pastor Jonathan has said, and I'm going to be honest with you, I'm a little bit behind on this series the Bible never contradicts itself, period. You can look anywhere in the Bible and it will support what it is saying. And if it seems like it's not, keep reading. It will eventually be explained. So if you want, next to verse 10, I want you to write Matthew 5, 8. Anybody here named Matthew? Oh, hi, Matthew. Anybody named John? No, I don't think so. I knew there was a Matthew, though, because I know his name. All right, 
Matthew 5.8, I'm going to read it to you. It says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Great. Now I have to be pure in my heart or else I can't see God. Right? Is that what it says? No. Mm, Kingston, come here. I want you to, nope, don't come here. Go stand in the king spot of nine square, please. Oh, this will be a first for you. This is special. You want us to take your picture so you can always remember it? Sorry, I'm being nice. No, no trash talk. I can't do that. That was cool. Okay, now, River, you come here, please. Sorry, if you want. I should ask for volunteers rather than making demands. <laughs> here. All right. Let's say Kingston is the king himself. That's God over there. We must be pure in heart right now because I can sure see God. Yeah? Can you see him? Yeah. I can see him. Do you have perfect eyesight? Hmm? Do you have perfect eyesight? No, oh, perfect. So now you have perfect eyesight. Yes. Perfect. So we perfectly see God over there. Hi, God. I want you guys to understand something. This line of sight, this is what God designed. He wants us to be able to see him clearly all the time. Now, in this verse, it says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So does that mean if I am not pure in my heart, I can't, I'm not allowed to see him? Okay, let's say I am a sinner. I can't see him, I can't see him anymore because I'm not pure in my heart. Kingston, go in that hallway where I can't see you. Again, I'm a mom. I'm all about simple visuals. Can I still see Kingston? Can you see Kingston? Nope. This is not what that verse is saying. This is not saying, since I am not pure in my heart, I'm not allowed to see God anymore. Okay, Kingston, go back to the King Square. All right, Kingston is God, and this is River. River, stand right here. River does her best, but by golly, she's a sinner. <laughs> bummer, 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 bummer. She just got saved immediately, pure in heart. God has washed her heart white as snow, clean slate, all the things, kumbaya, butterflies, falsetto worship songs, everybody's happy, perfect line of sight. Yeah? Wrong, because she's an imperfect human. So what she has decided is even though at youth last night, she had a great encounter with God, worship was amazing, Jamie brought a great word, what can I say? But now, this test she forgot to study for. <sighs> I don't know if you know this, she goes to a school with hard tests. But her friend studied really well and said, if you need a couple answers, I'll scoot down in my chair. Anybody ever done that trick? Let's scoot down in your chair. Don't nod. This is sure. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. You're safe here. So she made a sinful decision. Put these sunglasses on for me. All right. Welcome. You're cool now. You're river, but cooler. Okay, can you still see Kingston? Can you still see God over there? Yes. Does he look a little different? Yes. How does he look now? How does he look now? Like, <laughs> he's flexing in case none of you guys see him. <laughs> okay, let's say River continues on her day and let's get real for a second. Let's say River's anybody now. We're not going to say she's River. Let's say now she goes home and she's by herself. Her parents aren't home and she wants to make poor decisions through contacting a boy on her phone she's not allowed to talk to. Let's say River has all sorts of thoughts that are not glorifying to God. Um, do me a favor. Big Ben, will you stand up? I'm so glad that you three sat in that spot. And I'm going to show you why in a second. River, tell me something. Can you see Kingston? Yes. Amen. Yes. But you've been sinful. You've made poor choices that don't glorify God. Some would say they're not righteous. Can you still see God? Yes. But now it's a little bit darker and your view is a little obscured. Yes. Um, boy next to Big Ben, what's your name? John. John? Jonathan? A second ago when I was all like, is there a John? You weren't like, oh, that's basically my name. <laughs> that's fine. Okay. I bet you John in the Bible is also Jonathan, but he was all like, that's too many Hebrew letters. <laughs> all right, let's say now River's parents come home and they say, hey, did you do all your homework? And she's like, oh, dang, I forgot. No, I didn't, but I'm going to tell her I did. Sorry, River's mom is here, so we're not going to tell her about this. 
She says, I, I forgot I did, but I'm going to tell my mom I did, and then I'm going to go do it really fast. So it was still dishonest, but like it was only a lie for a little bit because then it became truth. Now Jonathan's in the way. Can you still see Kingston? Slightly. Sort of, yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we got one last one. What's your name? Talon. Talon. That's a cool name. So then let's say, I don't have any more sins for you. Let's just say there's another thing. Another thing that happened that doesn't glorify God. Gossip. Oh, there's some juicy text messages waiting for her, even though it's past phone curfew probably, but she's got to pass it on to somebody, even though the promise you won't tell. Sure. Immediately tells best friend, probably the one that helped you cheat on whatever test you weren't prepared for. <laughs> All right. So I got to ask you something. Can you still see Kingston? Still bar- barely. Okay. I want you all to look back at Kingston. Did he move? Did God change his position even though she has made poor decisions? She is no longer pure in heart. She can't see God clearly. It says, for they will see God. She can barely see him right now. And it's not because he punished her. It's because she filled her line of sight with something. She made decisions that stood between her and God. He has not moved. He has not left the building and said, well, I'm done with that. If she's not going to look at me, I'm out. Kingston, have you ever said that? (laughs) They're not going to look at me. I'm out. Okay, you three sit down. Give me your sunglasses. Blessed are the pure in heart because they will see God is not about you having to be pure in heart in order to be able to see God. It's about here's the clearest view. Thank you. You can go sit down. Go and sin no more. How many of you guys like a good hike? I love to hike. I was telling some people earlier about I went to Yosemite and I forgot to get the sweatshirt and I have regretted it ever since. But when I went to Yosemite, does anybody know what that is? It's a national park. Lots of rocks. It's great. Climb rocks. Except for don't go with Charlie because he won't let you climb the tall, dangerous ones because he, like, loves you and wants you to live or whatever. The first thing that I asked Google, does anybody want to know what it is? What is the best view in Yosemite? That's what I asked. And then I researched and I narrowed it down. And I found a hike and a path that was going to give me the best view. That's all. Oh, Kingston, you can come home. You can come home. You can come back. (laughs) Sorry. Thank you, God, for that. All I'm trying to do tonight is tell you where to find the best view. I'm not telling you how you have to change your life to earn God's love because that's not a thing. When we tell you how to sin no more. When we tell you how to best allow righteousness in your life, it is not because we are afraid of God condemning you or us condemning you. It's simply because we want you guys to be able to enjoy the best view possible. God has designed an open eye shot with him. We are the ones that can fill it with poor choices. He is not stepping out of our sight. So when we go back to this John 15, Verse 10, if you keep my commands, then you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. This is not about him saying, if you keep my commandments, then you can keep my love. This is the same principle of, if you keep my commandments, then nothing is standing in the way of being able to see me. How many of you guys have ever dated somebody that didn't believe in Jesus? And I know you stayed strong and dumped them immediately, or at the very least, didn't allow it to change the way you viewed Jesus. But if you tell me it didn't make you question or value it a little bit less, for a second, I won't believe you. Because we know things by the fruit it produces. When you allow something to stand in the way of your sight of God, it feels like we are no longer in that love or it's not as direct of a line. He didn't do that to us. That was not the punishment for our decision. It was a choice and a consequence that we implemented, okay? So now let's go up here. Let me look. (laughs) Let's do Matthew again. Matthew 7, a different part of Matthew. Matthew's great, full of great stuff. Well done, Matthew. So this is Matthew 7, 15 through 18. It says, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Everybody name your favorite fruit. Same time, go. 
Mango is apparently the overwhelming van kid favorite. How many of you guys have ever been walking through an apple orchard and been like, man, that's a great looking mango? No, because mangoes grow on the other side of the world. And I got to tell you, some of you guys are looking for a fruit that is growing in a whole different climate than where you're looking for it. Oops, dragon fruit doesn't grow anywhere over here. All right? You will know a fruit, or you will know it, you will know them by the fruit they produce. Now I lost it. Okay, do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. This is a science lesson, y'all. Do a science project on this, ace it, and give me credit, okay? How many of you guys in, like, elementary or whatever took, like, a carnation or a celery stick or something and put it in, like, water with food dye and watched the color bleed into it? Yes? No? How many of you guys have ever seen, like, the roses that have, like, the dark edge? They don't grow like that. They're put, they put dye in the soil or in the water to do that so that people can have blue roses in their wedding bouquet. They look weird. I know, I'm a florist. Whatever is nourishing a plant is going to come through into its fruit, okay? So if I want to know what kind of tree you are, I got to look at what kind of fruit you're bearing. Are you a good tree or a bad tree? Those are the only kind of trees that the Bible presents for you to be. Cade is a good tree. Good work, Cade. Okay. And so is Remy, never to be forgotten, the baby of the family. Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8. It says, but blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Reading the Bible has its perks. I also know that there's a really, really close verse to this in Psalms 1. It says, for he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, and it will bring forth fruit in its season, whose leaf does not wither, and whatever he does prospers. Same gist. It's in there twice. The Bible doesn't contradict itself. That's why I'm sending some of it home with you today. Because there's going to be an opportunity for the enemy to lie with you, lie to you, like immediately, maybe right now, maybe tomorrow, maybe in the middle of the night, maybe a year from now. And you have the truth. It's available to you. I'm going to um, do something somewhat blasphemous, and I'm going to change the words <laughs> just for the principle of it. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. Let's say blessed is the one who doesn't immediately get anxious when circumstances change. Or, preaching to myself here, they're not in full control all the time. Does anybody here like control? Does anybody like, please make all my decisions for me? That'd be great. Thanks. Okay, bye. Gross. Gross. I like to have control. Just ask my husband. I want him to plan dates for me, um, but I want him to do them the right way. He asks me, where do I want to eat? And I say, I don't care. And then he says a place. And then it turns out I don't know what I want, but I know all the things I don't want. For they will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out roots by the stream. For they'll be like people who tap into what matters who tap into what's never going to dry up, that's never going to change based off of circumstances. Do you know what a stream is? It's water that's moving. And that water is coming from maybe a different place geographically than the field that this tree is in. But if the roots are touching the stream, that tree doesn't have to worry about how much rain their field is getting. It just has to worry about the stream. That water is coming from somewhere else. A stream is moving water. We're not getting our water from the world. We're putting our roots into God. That's where our nourishment is coming from. It says, it does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. Again, because we're pulling water from the stream. It's an abundant supply. It has no worries in a year of drought, and it never fails to bear fruit. I like fruit. I like vegetables better, which is like the unpopular opinion. Anybody love like a roasted cauliflower? A little bit of cheese, a little bit of pepper. Maybe, maybe not. Vegetable soup, a little spicy. Put some spicy V8 in there. I'm about it. Fresh bread, I'm hungry. I have not eaten dinner. 
It says they never fail to bear fruit. And that's the same, the verse in Psalms also says, whatever they does prospers. That's bearing fruit. When you do something and it works, it's fruit. Okay? I think it's time for us to start reading John 15 at the beginning. John 15, everybody look at it with me and try really hard to engage. I have a really soothing voice. So I don't want you to get bored and fall asleep. It says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. We're going to stop already. I'm like, oh, this is so good. How many of you guys have been like, I feel like God is taking everything from me? It's okay. We can be honest here. Anybody ever been mad at God? Like, God, why couldn't you save my parents' marriage? Why didn't you hear, heal my grandparents or my friend's cancer? Why do we have to move to a different state in the middle of the school year? Why won't my girlfriend believe in you? All these things that you're like, maybe God is pruning your life. And you're like, but I really wanted to keep that branch. Like, I really like this one. Like, maybe someday if we just leave it alone, it will produce fruit. This is bagworm season. Does anybody know what that is? It's like the Halloween decorations that nature makes for itself. It's all the gross brown spider webs in the trees. Anybody ever seen that? Come on. Look up from your phone when you're driving sometime. You'll see it. And you'll probably hear your dad be like, oh, those bagworms are killing the trees. That's how, I heard, that's how I learned what they were. My dad always complained about the health of our tree. Does anybody know if those are good or bad for a tree? They're bad. You know how you get rid of them? You could spray, you could try to like pull it out, but the reality is once there are bagworms like creating habitat on a branch, you got to cut it off. Otherwise, it can reach the rest of the tree. This verse is saying, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. God gets rid of the bagworms. When I'm remaining in him, when I'm keeping my line open, my line of sight clear, I'm pure in heart, I'm seeing him, he will help me to remove the things that are just there to obstruct my vision. Okay, that hurts. It doesn't necessarily hurt so much when we cut the branches that bear no fruit. That's the dead stuff. It's like, yeah, I can do without the dead stuff. That's fine. The easy black and white issues. Does anybody have a friend that you know, like black and white, bad influence? No questions asked. Even if you're not implementing it, there's no judgment. You know the solution is simple with those. Cut the branch off. Okay, now. Here's the thing that's hard. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Has anybody ever walked through something hard and been like, why, why? This was going well, and now it's not. There are times in our life that God is at work beneath the surface, and he is pruning something that is bearing fruit, but he knows you're capable of better. You've kept that line of eyesight open and clear with him, and it hurts, and you're like, God, I'm trusting you. I don't understand. This is painful, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep my roots in the stream. I'm not going to fear the drought. I'm not going to fear the discomfort, but it's happening. You are pruning parts of me that were comfortable. Does everybody know who Zeke is? We're going to talk about Zeke for a second because I feel like that's the easiest example. I don't have to write a children's story. Where is Zeke tonight? In Texas. You know, I bet that that was a hard move. Anybody feel like he was really excited to go? You can all tell him uh, that I said this because this would be a great challenge to him. You know what I believe is happening? I believe that Zeke was comfortable and God is pruning something in him. His relationships here, his relationships with a lot of you bore good fruit doesn't mean they have to get cut off because it wasn't good fruit. I don't know if you guys know anything about gardening. You guys see all the roses out there? They're real pretty. Or like a tomato plant or something. There are times where you have to pinch off a bud of new growth, and it seems like counterproductive. It's like that was about to be a tomato, and now it's on the ground, and there are no tomatoes. But when that flower was pinched off, suddenly that branch has two or three shoots, and what was going to be one small tomato is three big tomatoes. When we're in a comfort zone and it seems like God is at work and there's something where it's not, it's not black, it's not white, but I still have this line of sight and I know that I'm experiencing God's peace, it's a pruning. 
It's a pulling out of your comfort zone, a pulling out of what you know so that you can produce even more fruit. And that's what it says here. He prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. All right, let's move on to verse three. We're not making very good time. Sorry. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. No more showers necessary. You're clean because God said so. You feel like you're being pruned. You feel like this dead stuff is getting on. It's like you have to start all over. It's like now I got to get Jesus in my heart again. I got to go all the way back. I got to tear down all the stuff between me and Kingston because I can't see anymore. You're already clean because of the word that he has spoken. You already have his righteousness. That has been rewarded to you, not for anything that you have done other than remain in his love. You hung out with the strawberry group, and now you smell like strawberries. It doesn't matter how much dirt is on you. You smell like a dang strawberry. You're welcome, children's stories. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. If I have a tomato plant, I don't even like tomatoes. If I have a strawberry plant, and there are some great strawberry fruits starting to grow, and I'm like, I've got an idea. I'm going to take it with me so that I can make strawberries over here. And I cut it off and I carry it around. What happens? Do I get more strawberries? It dies. Why? Because I removed it from its plant. Now it has no roots. It pulls no nutrients. There is no stream. It's a free sailing agent. Like, nope, dead. We can't produce fruit on our own, at least not good fruit. We have to remain in that vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, they're together, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So this is not a limiter. This is not like a without me, you're nothing. This is a God is saying he will bear the fruit in your life. You don't have to strain. You don't have to put righteousness on. You don't have to show up here so that you can bear the fruit. It's a, you show up here, you give God your heart, you follow after him, you press into things, the fruit happens. It just happens. What is a really bad show that none of you guys should watch that you watch? Not a trick question. This is not live streaming. Your parents aren't watching, probably. Emily. Yellowstone. Is that, the F word is in Yellowstone like a lot, right? And like, what's his name? Rip. How many of you guys watch Yellowstone? Good, terrible show. Um, I don't watch it either. I need a new example <laughs> all of a sudden. Okay, you watch a show. It's not great. Maybe it's not terrible, but you recognize yourself like the F word would fit right here really well. Or another bad word. Or maybe situationally, you're like, this is where I fall in love with this cute boy in the hallway. Or this is where that girl um, looks at me and passes me a cute note or something. Like, the things that you watch and the things that you're exposed to, you can begin to think that way, yeah? Or you can begin to act a certain way. If you do not, sorry. I lost my train of thought. I'm so sorry. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you begin to feed yourself from other sources, you will notice that coming through, like a color in a celery stalk or a rose petal that doesn't belong. If you like blue roses, that's fine. But when I see that, I know that it doesn't belong in that rose. Somebody put it there. That rose had to be dipped into something that it was not made for to turn that color. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. Here's this verse again. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. Second page. We're almost done. Does it feel good? Don't answer that. Verse 11, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Safe moment. There are some of you here that come here because you want to be here, but you dread it. It doesn't feel good to show up here or to leave. 
And I can tell you it's not because of God's presence that you feel that way. Some of you guys are missing that joy. There's a difference between joy and happiness. Happiness is like, oh, this makes me happy. Joy comes from within, and it's like, I've got to let it out. Not like in an annoying, really peppy person, like nothing bad happens in their life, and it's like, oh, my goodness, it's 830 in the morning, and I need you to take three steps back, turn around, and walk. Like, don't talk to me again until at least noon. That's my husband. (laughs) Fun fact, morning person, not a morning person. The Lord always takes one of each, and they get married, and then it's great. The joy is complete when you do this. If you're wondering what's missing about your church experience, about your God experience, about your experience with your Christian friends, the thing missing isn't God. Maybe you are mentally thinking, I'm not enough yet, or I need to smell a little bit more like strawberries before I'm in this group. I want you guys to know there are two kinds of people in here. Well, I mean, there's a lot of kinds of people in here, but there are two categories that I feel like a lot of us fall under. One, somebody that is struggling to feel like they're allowed to be here. And two, the person making them feel that way. Maybe even on accident. As somebody who grew up in church, this was my home court, my home field, my territory. I owned the church building. I basically carried my dad's keys around like they were mine. This was my comfort zone. This is where I was like, I came to play, guys. Like, this is, this is where I am my most me. And I walked around, and I spoke with authority and confidence, but also some self-righteousness. Has anybody ever heard that phrase? There's righteousness, and then there's self-righteousness. Self-righteousness, spoiler, doesn't come from God. It comes from us. Now, There is sin in the world. You guys encounter sin every day. And I'm not just talking about in the mirror. Like, I'm talking about, like, there are people in your life actively, willfully, and unrepentingly sinning. And you know the truth. You know what is good and bad. You saw that, and you're like, that's that's a bad fruit that just fell from you, and I'm, you're, it's a bad tree. Do you know that? They might be in a season where all they're trying to do is smell like a strawberry so that you'll accept them into the church body that they know you're a part of. If you have a friend, we're going to go here. If you have a friend who's struggling with homosexuality, who has decided something for themselves and put on a label that is not a God-given label, you do not have to clean them. That's not your job. You don't have to tell them all the things they need to do to have a clear sight with God. All you need to do in that moment is be a vessel of Christ's love for them. I think we started this by saying righteousness does not enable you to receive God's love. God's love is what will cause you to bear righteousness. Tonight, I want to make sure we are grabbing a hold of that for ourselves and we are ready to carry that truth to others. There is nothing you could do, decide, put on your body, change, or call yourself that will disqualify you from the love that God has for you. And there's nothing that they can do to disqualify themselves from love either. Love is all we have to worry about. God works on the righteousness for you and for others. Okay, verse 12, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you, like we just said. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for one's friend. You are my friends. God just said there's no greater love than laying down their life for a friend. And then Christ says, you are my friends. What did Christ do? For us as his friends. He laid his life down. He's the reason that I can see Kingston in that King Square. Even if I choose to put on sunglasses on, even if I have three massive teenage boys stand up, like I can still keep my line of sight with God because of what Jesus did for me, his friend. 
I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. Everybody bow your heads for me. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. You did not choose God. He chose you. You did not clean up to show up. All you have to do is stay connected to his love. Receive his love. Chase his love. Make him the thing that you fill your unbroken cup with. And from that, you will bear fruit. Now, if you're here tonight and you say, you know, I don't actually think I am a part of this vine that you're talking about. I don't think that I've fully acknowledged or received Christ as my Savior. I've got great news. You don't have to prepare for that. You don't have to come here deciding you're going to do that. You can make that decision now and allow Christ's righteousness to begin a new work in you, all because you said, yes, I want you to love me. I want to receive that love. Or maybe you're here and you are ready not to receive salvation because you've already received that, but you're ready to take a hold of the truth that there's nothing you could do to lose it. And that doesn't give you the excuse to live however you want, but rather the empowerment and the righteousness that you need to bear the fruit that you know he has called you to bear. A dead apple tree is still an apple tree. We don't call it something else. God calls us by the fruit he created us to bear, not just the fruit we are or aren't bearing. So repeat after me tonight, no matter who you are, no matter if you fall under one of those categories, Heavenly Father, I receive you. I receive your love. The love that was a gift of your life laid down for a friend's, and that friend is me. Not because of anything I've done, not because of anything I will do, but just because of your love and your love for me. I receive the call to obey you, not because I'm trying to be something, but because I'm fulfilled by your love. In Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, thank you for these students tonight. God, I thank you for the privilege to share your word with them. God, I thank you that this word, whether it is a seed or a watering of a seed, it's going to do something in their heart that is going to begin to bear fruit. They're going to be aware of that fruit and be able to see it and call it what it is. And that is good because they are good because of your love, not because of their good actions or good deeds or good thoughts, just because of your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Hold on, I got one more thought before that. After the prayer, there's one more verse that I got to tell you about because this is where the sneaky stuff starts. This is the moment where we're like, that made sense. Anybody like, yeah, that made sense. Raise your hand, please, or I'm going to feel really bad. This makes sense, but then you stand up, you turn around, you play nine square, you go home, and you're like, what did she say again? It doesn't make sense anymore. It no longer feels good. There are two things I want you to take. The paper, and I want you to take my word for it. You may not know me, but you can trust me. The enemy will try to take the peace that you feel anytime that something about God makes sense to you. It's not on here, but I read to you the verse from Jeremiah 17 that said, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. It was verse 7 through 8. Verse 9 says, but be careful because the heart is deceitful above all else, and nobody can cure that. How many of you guys have ever had a feeling, and that feeling steered you wrong? I want you to go tonight standing on the truth that God loves you and there's nothing you can do about it, even if you feel differently. The world says follow your heart. I say, mm -mm, don't listen to that. It does not want what is best for you. Okay, that's it. Now you can go. Or clap or whatever. 
All right. Hey, guys, we are not going to have small groups, but wasn't that awesome? Wasn't that worth it? Man, that was so good. Keep your papers. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to have about 20 minutes to hang out and play. Here in about five minutes, we're going to bring out some treats for you guys. So if you guys are hungry uh, for something that's going to hurt your tummy, we have it for you. There you go. So, uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for this amazing night. Pray that you bless these students. Um, go in peace, in Jesus' name. Amen.